Hi, my name is Luba, and this is Ratio Talks, a series by the Ratio Podcast. In this series, we do a variety of discussions with scientists from various fields. Uh, we try to go in depth on topics mostly to do with the physical world, and our main focus is the place of science and technology in our modern informational landscape. This is the second part of our discussion with Professor Matthew Hopp. Matthew is a zoologist from the University of Manchester. His research is largely focused on the sense of smell. He's a widely known pop sci author of books such as The Egg and Sperm Race, The 17th Century Scientists Who Unraveled the Secrets of Sex, Life and Growth, Life's Greatest Secret, The Race to Crack the Genetic Code, The Idea of the Brain, A History, and of course, his latest book, is titled The Genetic Age, Our Perilous Quest to Edit Life. Matthew, among other things, is also a good friend of mine and of great help when thinking about the messy and ambiguous world around us. Um, in this second segment uh, of our discussion, we focus mainly on the, um, on the topic of evolution versus AI the usefulness of metaphors and the need for narratives when we need to communicate so we can probably make better sense of this whole mess. And I hope you find it useful and also preemptively I apologize for just repeating uh-huh and hmm throughout the recording. It seems like, uh, it seems like he brings out the ape in me. And now I give you Matthew Cobb, part two. So the sirens went off. That was fun. It was very dramatic. I, was, I, yes. I ran to the cellar. Yes, well, <laughs> the wine cellar. <laughs> well, that would have yes. uh, I mean, um, we discussed a bunch of stuff related to smell, to the brain in general, to even consciousness uh, for a bit. And that was my first point of discussion. I have seven. <laughs> um, I don't, wow. Well. well, it's going to be a seven-hour special. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But uh, something that's um, really interesting for me um, from the way that you approach stuff is that you have a lot of historical um, context. Um, you know, we were just discussing about uh, Darwin and the seances, uh, we were talking about the, the caves in France, etc. Um, that's a, um, I think that's, that's a really, um, that's a really useful tool to contextualize innovation mm -hmm. uh, and to you know, think about some of the modern problems that we have right now. So uh, it could be anything from, um, you know, analogies from the atomic bomb to gene editing. It could be whatever. Um, would you say that this gives you uh, some kind of access and could potentially give access to a more nuanced way of thinking about uh, modern life? I mean, do you do it because of this or is it more of a aesthetics thing? Um I think it uh, helps to uh, make you a bit more immune to hype and to promises of radical change mm. or amazing new developments. Because if you don't need to think very ba far back, you think, well, wait a minute, you've said this before. So uh, recreating mammoths, de-extincting mammoths, that's my been one of my things that annoys me. Uh, I mean, in general, promises of change are... Uh, going to happen in five years. So within five years, it's we always have, five years. Yeah. So five years is really important figure because it's, it's close enough to seem exciting. So you should pay attention, but it's not so close that people's going, people are going to remember and say, yeah. wait a minute, you said we'd have jet cars in six months and where are they? Right. So yeah. they, you forget about it. And then the story comes around again in the case of yeah. the mammoth. Uh, it's, in, it's come around several times. Yeah. It's five years away. And now we've got the dodo and the thylacine. They're also going to de-extinct. And none of these things are going to mm. happen uh, for all sorts of reasons. But there's still this excitement, which mm. is not, you know, it's partly in us and in, in everybody. We, yeah. We're excited by these things and we forget that we've heard about them before. Uh, and so we, we focus on them again. And so sometimes just remembering, well, wait a minute, we've been here We've been here several times, so mm. maybe this isn't actually going to happen. It also then enables you to think more about the processes that are going on that have produced the mm. particular claim or excitement in the in the public. Um, I think more generally, it enables you to see how similar problems have been 
uh, identified and sometimes resolved or at least responded to in the past. Uh, and I think in particular at the moment with what's going on with AI. So, you know, we went from six months ago, eight months ago when ChatGPT was released, hmm. that it was mainly, you know, people like me, university professors going, oh, well, goodness me, this AI could pass my exam. I'm going to have to come up with a better set of questions yeah. or we must ban it completely. Or as we've done at our university, short answer questions are now having to be done in a room, students having to write answers for the first time, because we know that if we leave them at home, chat GPT, it can't write a good essay, but mm. it can write a short answer. And if they're lucky, it'll give the right answer mm. to something short. It's not bad. So we've moved from that kind of, well, this is a threat to something quite niche, you know, higher mm. education or education in general, to now they're saying, well, it's an extinction level threat to mm. everybody. Yeah. So this is a technology which is clearly very powerful, which has also got potential for fantastic advantages. Mm. Uh, so even in an educational context, I, I kind of mellowed because I realized, okay, I've got lots of overseas students, you know, a lot of them from China. So they've got good English, but their written English isn't brilliant. You know, my written Mandarin would be <laughs> non-existent. Uh, you know, I speak French very well. My written French is not very good. What would be wrong with a student who's written an essay in mm. their slightly wonky English, putting that into chat GPT and say, please Fix turn it. this into English. Yeah. What's the difference between that and me saying to them, as I do to all the students, put spell check on, run it through grammar check. Mm. That's just polite to me, right? It mm -hmm. means that you haven't got silly mistakes in there. Yeah. We tell them to do that. And that's kind of very primitive, stupid level mm. AI. Um, so, you know, this could be good in education. It would allow non-English speakers or, you know, people who speak different languages poorly to communicate better. Hmm. That's got to be good, right? I mean, yeah. I can't see any problem with that. The problem, however, is uh, both in terms of it then lying to us, convincing me that the Pope was wearing a puffer jacket. I'm sorry, I bought that one. And when that <laughs> picture came out, I thought it was fantastic. It looked great. Yeah, well, except when you looked and he had six fingers and oh, two well, sets of know. teeth, and maybe he does. That's, uh, <laughs> I've never seen him. He's who a knows? reptile. Yeah, who knows what he really knows. looks like? Um, so, you know, fault, fake, fake news, which we've already had enough problems with. Uh, in the UK over the Brexit referendum mm -hmm. uh, and also in the USA uh, in 26, same year, 2016, it was a mm. bad year. Um, that could really become absolutely catastrophic if it wasn't, mm. you know, if it was actually... You think this will feed into it? Oh, yeah, inevitably. I think it's already, mm. yeah, there's plenty of evidence already that's being used uh, mm. to produce fake information. There are websites now that set, have sacked all their writers and said, well, we're just going to use the AI. Yeah. I mean, the problem yeah. is it's going to produce awful, tedious, dull crap, but, and it's going to be wrong. But if we, if we take uh, the, the positive spin on this and, and look at it uh, in terms of adaptation to, to, to new stresses, so uh, surely uh, there could be some kind of analogy with technology in general. So, uh, mm, for example, uh, for example, uh, my grandma that passed away, uh, I tried to teach her to use the internet. And that was years ago. The, the internet was still roughly yep. new, uh, like 15 years ago or so. Uh, but she just couldn't yeah. uh, do the thing. And she managed to find a few websites. She would send me links with all kinds of crazy bullshit, just insane stuff. <laughs> and she was a well-educated woman. She she taught mathematics. She, she's very balanced, very very actively political, etc. So, I mean, she, she was very critical of stuff. But... For example, for her, uh, the case of having something in a news site on the internet gave like a hundred percent credibility. Yeah, so absolutely. it's weird, but I guess that's the thing. Uh, so wouldn't we be able to say that in the same sense that I was able to discern that this is obvious bullshit um, because of the oversaturation that we'll see with AI content? Uh, basically, even if we suck at identifying AI content right now, let's say. I can roughly discern sometimes some kind of uh, uh, some kinds of text that were done by uh, um, AI, and there's some telltale signs of some stuff. Mm, it wasn't yeah. if it wasn't edited by a human afterwards. Um, but let's say uh, the current teenagers uh, that will grow up basically yeah, yeah. with uh, GPT-4 or the equivalent uh, at some point they'll be like. Oh, 
man that's obviously was in Bayern. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Are yeah. you oh, fucking crazy? That's of course, the Pope the wasn't fuck? wearing a yeah. puffer jacket. You can tell. So wouldn't it be case, uh, a case of uh, we aren't adapted to it because we wouldn't be growing up with yeah. it? And at some point, it, yeah, it might be a hellhole for like 10 years. And well, then, yeah, I think I think, I think that's true. I mean, the, the, the classic example uh, of precisely fake news and deliberate manipulation of populations goes back to the 19th century in printing when the czarist secret police concoct, they invent the protocols of the elders of Zion, which is this document that claims that the Jews are out to control the world, which they aren't, if anybody's in any doubt. So this is a fake printed document. That's so a tough job, you, by the way. Yeah, well, it's, people still believe it, right? So the fact that it's not yeah. printed on paper, but is on documents on the internet, yeah. there are plenty of people who are either... Uh, already anti-Semitic, who then use it as an extra justification, uh, or who are just kind of very uncertain about the world and then believe this uh, when they read it on a website. But it is, was completely invented. We have the same thing in the in the UK hmm. uh, in the 1920s. Uh, there was a lot of strike action, and the British Secret Service uh, wrote a fake letter from Grigory Zinoviev, the Comintern leader, to the British trade unions, basically saying, yes, kill the bosses. Um, and this was a complete fake. Uh, but the Daily Mail published it and said, yes, look, they want to yeah. kill the bosses. It's all a communist plot. So, you know, and it, you know, fake news is inherent in yeah. publication or in communication, right? You know, yeah. I hear the tribe over the other side have got some extra food. Let's go and get it from yeah. them or whatever. I don't know. Hearsay. <laughs> yeah. So the question then comes is, one, does the sheer volume of the stuff and the rapidity with which lies and what well, information of any kind could be transmitted now which is instantaneous to the mm. whole world through something that is in your pocket right so that's a bit slower than the czarist police having to go around and leave copies of the this mm. fake document around for people to read or to say well i've read yeah. this so so there's a, a a volume effect and a speed effect which we might think is qualitatively different there's also i think the thing we've got to really worry about and what really scares me about ai is not only the the effects. I mean, I don't think I, I am worried about it, but I'm not worried about it because I think it's going to become conscious and come back from the future mm. and try and wipe mm. us out. Yeah. But it's a good movie, though. Well, it's a great movie, but that's not going to happen. And I don't think Skynet is suddenly going to, you know, it's good. The internet is going to suddenly become self aware yeah. uh, because mm. I, it's much more complicated than that. Um, but there is the possibility for bad actors to manipulate us. And secondly, the increased use of computer hardware and software in technology and killing technology is really hmm. very alarming. There's a, a terrifying um, video uh, on YouTube made about a, so it's a, a fictional video, but it, it looks absolutely real of this kind of Steve Jobs character presenting uh, these, his new bots, these, these mini drones right. that can take out the bad guys. And he's got the AI that can take out the bad guys. And he presents this as a way of resolving, you know, this yeah. is exactly the discourse of you yeah. know, presidents like. There's a Black um, Mirror episode like yeah. this. So, me. you know, what could possibly go wrong? Well, everything goes wrong, obviously. <laughs> um, and we now, know that that is actually happening or oh, it's being tested so hmm. in today's newspapers uh there so friday the 2nd of june there is the case of a simulation so it's not actually been done real but they simulated a drone that had to hit certain targets hmm. okay and it's got an ai and it's getting points so its goal is to maximize its points that's what you hmm. tell it to do and it gets points for shooting targets Great. But of course, you, you can't just let one of these things work on its own. You've got to have a human who can say, no, no, that's the school you're targeting, not a military depot. So the human is intervening sometimes and the drone is trying to attack things and the human is saying, no, you can't do this. So after a while, the drone, the AI controlling the drone works out, wait a minute, my sole aim in life is to get maximum points. There is this interface that is telling me to stop doing it. Hmm. So it attacks the human. It attacks the human operator who's because yeah. that's the gate point. So they said, okay, right, okay, right. We, we, we'll reprogram it. We'll say, yes, you've got to uh, attack these targets, but you mustn't attack the human uh, operator. That's a bad thing. Okay, you'll lose points for that. So what does the AI do? It recognizes it can't attack the human, but the human is in a you know is in a hut somewhere with a radio antenna. Mm -hmm. 
Because and so it attacks the radio antenna. So yeah. now the, it can't be told, don't attack. So there's a kind of dynamic to this. I mean, you, you could reprogram the whole thing to say, oh, you will only get points if the human says you, yeah. you can attack this. But even so, that shows you the kind yeah. of principle that uh, you know, a simple algorithm yeah. can produce rather unpleasant results. And that's the kind of yeah. thing that, that I'm worried about. So basically it's a... Uh... Uh, yeah, I, I agree with you. Basically, a paperclip maximizer scenario is, is, is the worst. <laughs> but I mean, who gives a shit if it's conscious or not? If it if it does what it says it does on the yeah, box, it's absolutely. probably the worst, the worst possible misery for everyone forever. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's one thing I'd like to end with, and I think it's um, really useful because you you use it in your book, uh, Idea of the Brain. Um, you know, you point out that uh, metaphors are kind of useful but not always um not always accurate uh, and and they serve as limitations uh in a mm -hmm. sense so uh i'd like to talk about metaphors in general as tools so would you say that uh metaphors could be uh something of a creative force or a communicational tool in which we can actually impart knowledge and uh, come to new um, new results or new ideas, etc. Or rather, they're more of a, like a bridge for low bandwidth communication. I mean, uh, is it something that's, uh, you know, is it a strong tool or, or is it something that people will use in lieu of actual understanding? Well, I, I think it's both. And I mean, all science in particular uses metaphors. You have to, uh, to try and understand these amazingly complex phenomena. And the, the classic example is physics, right? Exactly. Where right. as people go through their education, they realize that they have been, you well, to be blunt, they've been lied to. So mm. People have given been given a metaphor. You know, the, the exactly, atom yeah. is like a It's like a billiard ball, right? Exactly. Well, no, it's not like a billiard ball. It's like a, uh, and then you learn that it's like a little solar system with yeah. the electrons whizzing around. Well, it's, not really it's not that. And then you end up with it's this cloud of potentiality, right? Uh, yeah. Which I don't really understand, you know. And in general, what happens is that by the time students get to the uh, university level physics, that's when they really learn what's really going on. That everything they've learnt before that it's has, been an has been an approximation, yeah. right? And within certain boundaries, it's true. <clears throat> I mean, you can think of this in terms of, you know, Newtonian physics, which is what explains, you know, billiard balls bouncing around on a table. Hmm. That's absolutely fantastic. If all you want to do is understand billiard balls, it's what we use for understanding the motion of the planets, right? Hmm. So on a big scale, that's absolutely fine. But underneath that is subatomic and, you know, quark, based physics that I don't understand. And even beyond that, uh, where it's just all fields, man, <laughs> it's just fields of stuff <laughs> that are interacting. Yeah. Um, and But even that, yeah, a field, yeah. what does that mean? That's a metaphor. Yeah. So you end up, you can't escape them because ultimately, in, well, in particular in physics, you're not, at, the only way to finally understand that is through the language of maths, which is, mm escapes metaphor in the end it has to by using these different formal languages different language than yeah. the one we're using to to speak and to conceptualize it. i mean i can't do that i you know certainly mathematicians are thinking in a different way to somebody like me because they're using this different abstract language to process and imagine how those concepts can interact to produce a particular answer But even in, in biology, right? So you think of the gene as a particle, as a unit. Hmm. That's how you have to explain. We explain that, uh, you know, characters are inherited. And so we learn at school uh, that uh, if you've got blue-eyed parents, they have two copies of, uh, each parent has two copies of the eye color gene and they've got the blue gene, right? Hmm. And the blue gene is what we call recessive. So if you have one blue gene and one brown gene, then the brown gene is dominant. The brown gene is expressed and the blue gene hmm. in some way isn't. And we learn all that at school and that always causes problems because somebody in the class goes, wait a minute, I've got brown eyes and my parents have got blue eyes. You're telling me that's not possible. Um, and if that were true, if we had one gene for eye color, that would indeed be a problem. Yeah. And indeed, it, in many cases, it may well be. So any listeners who've got blue-eyed parents and they've got brown eyes, you well, who knows what went on? That's questions, question, sir. Yeah. 
But the answer can be that in reality, there are dozens of genes involved in eye colour. The last count, there were 60. So it is technically possible that anybody with any colour eyes can be born to any parents with any combinations. It's pretty unlikely. So in general, if you do have two blue-eyed parents, they're going to have brown-eyed uh, offspring. If they have brown eyes, mm. the parents have brown eyes, they could have brown eyes, or they could have blue eyes, uh, depending on how it works out. But there are, because there are 60 genes, they're mm. all interacting in different ways. And just like with the smell genes, there are many, many versions of these mm. genes. There are variations within them that are going to interact and that will produce huge variability. So the, mm. this very simple particulate model that the gene is a particle it's a bead on a chromosome it sits there mm. i mean this is none of this is true genes some genes can move their position depends on what they are in general eye color genes are in a fixed position but some genes pop about and move mm. their position they're, they're called transposons cool. they'll shift um but the problem is that, I mean, you talk about low bandwidth communication. I think it's more that if you were to start off explaining to an 11-year-old who's in a physics mm. class, okay, it's all about fields, man. You've got to learn this complicated maths. Yeah. They're going to go, uh, I don't know. Tell me about <laughs> billiard balls. I might understand that, right? So it's partly, and there's partly a tradition here. And for example, in eye color, in genetics, I don't think we need to teach that way. And the people are increasingly trying to, think about ways of teaching the more complex version from the very beginning, because hmm. it's not so mind bogglingly complex as quantum mechanics, right? I mean, it is, you can understand it if you're 12, yeah. um, because there are implications. So this is where the metaphor of you know, beads on a string, each bead is determining something, becomes problematic, because that's not true. But you take with into the future, the idea that genes do things, they are genes mm. for things, and that they are entirely deterministic. Whereas, in fact, many, but not all genes, are probabilistic. They mm. depends on what other genes you've got there. And you've got 20,000 protein-determining yeah. genes in the your genome. The world is messy. Yeah, the world's very messy, and it depends on context, and you may get a different result from the one you expect. And that's one reason why we were talking about history all earlier on why it took so long for people to understand about genetics because it's quite amazing in that people didn't know they weren't certain that characters were transmitted down the generations right hmm. and it wasn't because they didn't think about it so william harvey who is the english scientist let's call him at the beginning of the 17th century he's the guy who uh, in the European world, first suggests that the blood circulates, okay? Uh, the idea would have been around, and he knew about this, the Arabs had thought about this as well, but he, he's got some pretty good evidence, although he didn't actually nail the evidence, he couldn't prove it. But anyway, he thinks very hard about this, and he says, okay, look, why is it that sometimes offspring look like their grandparent, Sometimes they look like both parents and sometimes they only look like one. And he takes three examples. He says, well, okay, so eye color. Sometimes you end up with the color of eyes of your grandparents. Mm. So that would be in the case where the grandparent has blue eyes, you have blue eyes and the parents have got brown eyes. So they've got a mixture in these genes mm. and they've, in a, I mean, that generally works. It doesn't always work, as I said, but it's, it's roughly right. So, okay, sometimes it's like your grandparents. And sometimes he says, well, look, you've got a black person and a white person and their skin color is a mixture. Hmm. And then he takes another example. He says, but, and what about sex? So you've got men and women and most babies, there are some hermaphrodite babies, but the vast majority are either boys or girls. So how does all that work? Hmm. And he basically says, I have no idea. So there's something happening, but it doesn't make any sense, right? Because, in fact, what he's de described are three different kinds of genetic uh, transmission. Mm. You've got particulate, more or less particulate inheritance, like an eye colour, with dominant and recessive. So that can skip a generation. You've got blending inheritance. So you've got bazillions of genes involved mm. in skin colour, and you mix them up, and hey, you get a mixture between the two. And then finally... You've got sex determination, which is completely different, which is largely dependent on the possession of certain kinds of chromosomes. Mm. And that's why you are, in general, either male or female. Uh, you look like one of your parents mm. in terms of your sex. 
So people were thinking about this, but they couldn't work out any answer. And to find the answer, to finally end up with genetics, because it is not deterministic, but probabilistic, mm. you need huge data sets. You mm. need a lot of numbers to see the patterns coming out. And that happened in the uh, 18th century in two ways. Firstly, people looked at, uh, they looked at uh, genealogical trees in France so families where they had lots and lots of information going back several, you know, 10 generations. And they looked at what's called polydactyly, which is where somebody has an extra finger, hmm. not by AI, <laughs> yes. but because they actually have an the extra original. finger. Yeah, the original version, the real one, <laughs> not fake news. And they could see that there's something going down. There would be this transmission of this character was going down the generations. And then above all, there was an English gentleman farmer called Bakewell, in the 18th century. Was he a baker? Uh, no, he was a farmer. Oh, he made, uh, he he bred sheep. And this is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution in the UK. Mm. So you've got big uh, populations in the cities. Mm. They need feeding. And what Bakewell realized is that by carrying out selective breeding, he could reduce the time that it would take for the sheep to grow to selling weight because you don't want to sell a lamb because you only get a small amount. Of, it's mm. very tasty, but you only get a small amount of meat on it. So it used to be it took two years for the sheep to get sufficiently large that it was then mm. worth selling to uh, the butchers. By selectively breeding, by choosing which animals to make with which, and by writing it all down, by keeping immense notebooks of this data set and knowing, okay, I can make these two together. I will get, I'll reduce the time and well, I'll increase the speed with which the animal grows, right? Mm. That's what's happening. Uh, they're growing faster and faster. He ended up with this special breed called the Dishley Lester, which would reach selling weight in a year in 50% of the time. Hmm. So he became amazingly wealthy because people, and people wanted to know, well, how have you done it? And he kept it secret. He wasn't going to tell them. But he had seen this, this pattern, and this attracted attention of mm. people all over the world. And by the end of the 18th century, people started to talk about heredity. Mm. So as a force, as a thing, up until that point, the only thing you could inherit was debt. Very occasionally diseases, but not really. But through these two processes, one, this genealogy of uh, polydactyly, of having an extra mm. finger, and secondly, through uh, Bakewell's work, people realized there was something being transmitted. And what happened was that other farmers got very interested in this idea. And in particular, there were sheep farmers uh, in Brunel, uh, in what is now the, the Czech Republic, um, where they, they, didn't, they weren't interested in meat, they were interested in wool, quality of wool. And they had uh, the various sheep farmers and also the monastery there, which they didn't have a university, but they had a monastery. And the monastery had lots of land, had lots of orchards, mm. and it also had lots of sheep. And they had this big meeting of all the sheep farmers to try and discuss these ideas that were coming over from England. They said, look, we should really be able yeah. to, we should copy what he's doing, what Bakewell did for weight and meat. We should do it for wool quality. A sheep forum. Yeah, there you go. And the, uh, the head of the monastery, Abbe Knapp, said, no, no, look, you're all missing the point. Yeah, we do need to have better breeding programs so we can increase the crop of or, you know, apples or whatever. Mm. And the monastery was interested in that because that's where its wealth came from. But he said, no, there's something much more fundamental we've got to get at. What is inherited and how? Mm. And he's the first person to ask that question. Mm. What is actually going on? What is this thing? Now, he was in charge of the monastery, okay? So he had lots of other things to do. So he got a young monk Mm. a young, brilliant, science-trained monk called Gregor Mendel mm. to solve the problem. So Mendel, who we often learn about as being this crazy guy studying peas, why was he doing that? He was like uh, a brilliant postdoc in a current scientific lab. He was put onto the project by the principal investigator who was too busy to do it, who was the Abbe Knapp, who had the great idea, said, look, Greg, you just see if you can figure this out. You know, do it with, initially he tried it with mice, that didn't work. So, yeah, okay, peas, that would be good you can get lots and lots of numbers. And that's yeah. what Mendel had. He had so many seeds produced by his pea plants that this was a bit like uh, Bakewell's sheep data with hundreds and mm. thousands of sheep. Now Mendel had hundreds of thousands mm. of seeds that he could then classify 
And by choosing a particular character, round or wrinkled, the character's shape of the peas, he can actually see that what's going down and what happens when you hybridize two kinds. That's what he was really interested in. We've got two kinds of thing. We put them together. What comes out? Why mm. does that come out? So ultimately, you know, the basis of genetics was all based on realizing that we needed probabilistic data. We needed mm. large data sets. And that just looking at particular examples, why do I have the same color eyes as mm. my granddad? Why am I the same sex as my father and not as my mother? Why is my skin color a mixture of my parents? I can't figure that out, right? It's just perplexing. It's too bizarre. Mm. Uh, and no explanation that anybody could have thought up in the, 18th, in the 17th century would have explained Harvey's three examples. They are fantastic examples, but of qualitatively different phenomena mm. that you can only understand by having a, a big populational level understanding. <laughs> I love the fact that you can contextualize with uh, historical historical stories, basically, and, and stuff. I mean, and that, that's something, that's a specific skill nowadays. I mean, <laughs> but, you know, I mean... But I'm very old. I've been doing it a long time, right? So, so <laughs> I but, can remember but stuff. But it's really, really useful because right now, um, if I, I might have some domain knowledge in something, but some of the context is lost to me. I don't know how we got there. Yeah. I just know the the, the datum. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, that's that's generally what we teach. You know? So yeah. science is taught as a body of facts. And if there is a an introductory chapter in a textbook mm. or a little bit in a class or in a lecture, it's always going to be very brief and it will be about a handful of old blokes mm. with beards. And they were just smart, right? They were just clever. They were like, yeah, they're, yeah, they're clever like I'm clever, you know. So the implication <laughs> is that this is all building up to the person who's doing the talking. And that's the way we, you know, if you write an introduction to a scientific article, sometimes people are quite fancy and they start off with Aristotle or somebody, you know, yeah. this idea goes back to Aristotle. <laughs> and the implication <laughs> is that, of course, all of human knowledge is now building up to me and my bizarre the study. The yeah, of my study. Yeah, of maggot noses or whatever, you know, <laughs> everything, all of human culture goes up to this. So there's a terrible egotism to it. Um, and of course, that's history told by the victors, whereas the interesting history And the actual history is full of mistakes and errors and people mm. get things wrong or they come up with the right answer, but for the wrong reason. Mm. Uh, and that's that's always fascinating because that's happening right now. Mm. And so you apply that to where we are today. And it brings me back to what I was saying. It makes you much more cautious about claims, yeah. makes you, you know, skeptical. If you've got a massive claim, then you need really fantastic evidence. Mm. Uh, and sometimes, as I say, you can see the same thing coming back, the same mm. idea coming back, and that kind of makes you wary or makes you excited. Think, okay, this time we can solve this problem. But also it, it kind of brings us back to uh, the point about metaphors and narratives in general, that they're actually really good at mm. grounding us um, for some specific topic, being able to actually appreciate or just take it in um because it could be too abstract it yeah. could be something goddamn crazy uh there's um uh i have a favorite author that uh, writes a lot about physics uh his name is uh, carlo rovelli mm -hmm. and he's amazing yeah fantastic and, books yeah and they're really short books they're not all the top he he writes Uh, concisely but always with a narrative it's usually yeah. a personal narrative or through through something else i think that's um that's probably if i have to give an example of a right way to use analogies or metaphors or just a narrative that's the thing yeah. and that works really well and i've been for example interested in physics um most of my life um i've studied physics as well and When I first read his uh, first book, uh, I think it was uh, Studies in Physics or something uh, similar like this, read in Bulgarian. It just gave me more knowledge in a weird way. Yeah. Even though I studied this, I, I had more understanding about what he was talking about, which I think is, I think is great. And I can see that what you're doing is basically in the same domain. I mean, <laughs> well, the, I'm not as talented as him, that's for sure. Well, I mean, uh, again, I'm not as good a writer. That's you you good, obviously but, have yeah. different approaches uh, <laughs> yeah. to, to this thing, but using narratives and trying to get people engaged into the process of how, how we got here, um, you know, with the yeah. idea of the brain it was the same. It's, I think, a really qualitatively different thing than just trying to describe stuff even if you describe it very well uh, the narrative just uh, makes the pill easier to swallow yeah absolutely i mean humans 
we love telling stories. You know, this yeah. is often what I think about when we were talking earlier about early human culture, right? And we are limited by definition, by the stuff we can find, the stuff that they left behind, the paintings or the, you know, the the arrowheads or whatever. Yeah. And what we don't have, because they've evaporated, are the the songs, the stories, you know, yeah. that people will not have just sat around the campfire of an evening yeah. and sat there like your poor old orangutan yeah. thinking, oh, Jesus, yeah, yeah. they're going to be telling each other stories. They'll be telling uh, the, the huge fibs about, oh, yeah. you should have seen the mammoth that got away. <laughs> it was huge. We nearly got it, right? Uh, or they'll be telling stories about the stars, you know, about what there is up there and the culture mm. And uh, oral culture, people learning to stories, inventing stories, transmitting them orally. And that's so sad that, you know, that's gone. We'll never get it back. We'll never know Hmm. unless they left some physical trace. And then it's going to be, we won't be able to connect that to the story. You know, it'll just be some object that won't mean anything to us. But, you know, yeah, people will be singing. They'd be dancing. uh, They'd be telling stories. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, You know, we, our culture is quite astonishing. But if you think of the stuff that we really like, we like, uh, you know, so the, the, the trivial level, you know, what are people going to watch on TikTok? They're going to watch people dancing, doing great dance moves. They're going to watch a cat doing something stupid and they're going to watch somebody telling a joke or something. And that's kind of fundamental to all yeah. human si- societies. Mm-hmm. And uh, my guess is that the Neanderthals were doing something very similar. We might not have got their jokes. Maybe they had a different <laughs> sense of humor. But I, <laughs> You know, yeah, I bet, our jokes. That I, would be well, good. I bet it involved, you know, slapstick, people falling over, people being stupid. <laughs> Shut having thing, yeah, bad things happening to, or you know, bad things happening to bad people. Yeah, we like that, you know, <laughs> um, or just stupid things happening and people who are quite prestigious or whatever, or esteemed, mm. then, you know, having a pratfall and looking, slipping on a banana skin. No bananas were there, but, it's you know, that kind of thing. Uh, I suspect that that's common to all of us. Well, Matthew, it was an absolute pleasure for me to steal close to two hours of your oh time. My God. <laughs> People aren't going to listen to this, I hope. Well, maybe if they're going on a run or something, doing some exercise, listen to it in bits, folks. You don't have to listen to the whole thing. Pace yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Again, thank you. Thank you for doing this with me. Thank you for coming to Sofia. To oh, well, thank you for inviting me, Lubo. I mean, look, this is, I think this is a fantastic city. Ratio is, I think, unique. I mean, I've never come across an organization like this, right? And you, yeah. you said Hopefully me, in a good way. <laughs> yeah, in a very good way. You know, why did I take a punt? I just thought, okay, look, let's just give it a go. And then it was so well organized, even at the very beginning, right? You were so professional and such a great team that I not only Thank was you. very keen to come back when you invited me, but I've also, as you know, many, you know, I've encouraged yeah. people and suggested people to, I've got some more names for you for the future uh, that Sounds you might awesome. find interesting interesting sounds awesome well let's uh, also thank uh, viewers or listeners depending how you're using this uh, content be it uh, on youtube or one of your podcatchers um, if you'd like to support us you can do it on uh, www.ratio.bg support again thanks for listening until next time